Whoops, that wasn't intended. <laughs> Jump the gun there. Good morning, and welcome to the Boulder Valley Unitarian Universalist Fellowship. We are back to multi-platform <laughs> services again, yay! Good morning, Zoomies, I'm glad you're there too. So it is just so good, the feeling here of watching this room slowly fill up and all the people bringing their caring lives into this space, it's a completely different Sunday morning for me, and I'm just so delighted to be back here with you. I'm the Reverend Lydia Ferrante Roseberry, and I'm joined today by our service associate, Larry Lavender. Uh, Jim Highsmith is offering a testimonial today, and Tad Corieth, Grace String Fellow, and Mary Stagpole are providing music today. Thank you so very much. And we have an excellent tech team for everybody this morning. Bill Beachley, Larry Sherwood, and Karen Griglack. And of course, all of you who make up this beloved community. It is so good to be together. I have a quick technical announcement for anybody who's here in person. Please do not connect to Zoom while you're here um, because it can mess up with the, um, it can provide feedback and do all sorts of stuff and drive our tech people a little nutty. So only if you need to um, if you're for the service. As I say our welcome words today, I invite those of you on Zoom to switch into gallery mode if you haven't already done so and scroll through the screen so you can see and connect to those who are also joining you from their homes on Zoom. And those of you in person, just take a look around and see who you might be able to recognize underneath their masks. <laughs> and if you are new here, I hope you can experience, imagine all the smiling faces underneath the masks as well and the welcome to you. You are all welcome here today. In all the beauty of languages, cultures, skin tones, shapes, and sizes that come together in your uniqueness, you are welcome here. In all the ways that you experience and express gender, you are welcome here. In the beauty that is who you love and how you love, you are welcome here. In all the ways you make your living, and all the places you are from, you are welcome here. With all of the traditions that inform your spiritual life, you are welcome here. No matter how long you are away, nor how soon until you return, you are welcome here. Whether you come with laughter in your heart today or with tears, you are welcome here. You are invited to join us with an open mind a loving heart and willing hands. We welcome everyone here today. And I want to actually make a special welcome to our families of people with kids, many of whom have been really separated from us through for the pandemic. So just seeing some of these families in this room now is just really warming my heart. Welcome back. <laughs> welcome back, families. We as a fellowship acknowledge the land surrounding us is the stolen territory of the Arapaho people and that many tribes on this land uh, li roamed freely on this land for millennia before the arrival of white settlers. We commit ourselves to be a center for spiritual exploration and justice making and to anti-racism and anti-oppression work within and beyond the walls of our congregation. Well, we are four weeks into our pledge drive. <coughs> that means there's only three weeks left. You can see our little things there. The lollipops are those of you who pledged. And the, dot, and the little ping pong balls are the amount of money we've raised. So we have had 78 
pledgers for a total of $262,000, so that's fantastic. We're over 50% to our goal of $472,000. So that's awesome. We are well on our way. But I'm going to tell you, this is the time in the pledge drive when those of us who are behind the scenes start to lose sleep. So if you would like to help the pledge team and the finance team and the staff and your minister sleep better, and you're not represented by one of those lollipops, please do accept your appointment with your steward, have a wonderful conversation to reconnect you with the congregation, and make your pledge. So we need about an average of a $200 a month pledge to reach our goal, and we know not everybody can do that. So if you could do a little more than that, you can make up for people who can do a little less. And do know that every pledge is important because every pledge is a part of building this community in the many ways that we do that. If you are new here, we are really glad you found us and hope that even in this multi-platform community, you can experience the warmth and the love of this congregation. Each Sunday is a little different here, so please come back a few, few times to get to know us. And we have many of opportunities during the week for engagement and spiritual growth and justice activities. Those on Zoom can check out the links in the chat to get you better connected. And those of you here in person today, just go out to the welcome table following the service and they can help you connect up to all the things we do. And finally, if there's any new visitors on Zoom and you'd like to introduce yourself in the chat briefly, just your name and where you're from, that would be wonderful. That way people can we start to get to know you on Zoom. And if there's any visitors here in the sanctuary who would like to say hello, you may do that as well. Just uh, stand if you're comfortable doing so, or raise your hand and let us know you're here. And we will um, just tell us your name and where you're from. Good morning. Welcome, Suzanne, and I didn't catch your husband's Bob. Welcome, Suzanne and Bob. Anyone else this morning want to say hello? Hi. Whoop. We'll go over there and then over there. Hi, good morning. Welcome. I'm sorry I can't, I can't hear well enough what you're saying. We will have make sure people greet you on our way out as well, okay? Welcome. I'm so glad you're here. Hi. Well, welcome. Glad you're here, Elizabeth and Rich from Louisville. Great. And good morning. Oh, great. Welcome, Kathy. Glad to have you. Yeah. Good morning. That is my dear friend, Lisa Hassan from Avon, Colorado, visiting me today. So thank you. Good to see you, Lisa. Everybody on Zoom is invited to stay for a virtual coffee hour following the service. And those of you here are invited to linger physically distanced. And we won't be having our coffee hour just yet. We're just waiting for for us to feel uh, safer around COVID, but you're certainly willing to stay following the service and chat with your friends. If you have a chalice at home, you're free to light it now as I light our fellowship chalice. And um, write in the chat where your chalice is lit from, where you are lighting your chalice. And please join me in saying our chalice lighting words. We light this chalice for the warmth of love, the light of truth, and the energy of action. Now I invite you to let the sound of the second bowl draw you deeper into the present moment and into the company of this gathered community.
Our soul, our soul Matters theme for the month is Renewing Faith. So today, we're starting with some reflections about prayer. Now, I know the concept of prayer may be tricky for those of you who don't believe in a personal God, but, pr but prayer does not require that belief, and it's also not foreign to Unitarian Universalists. You actually can be a Unitarian Universalist and pray. I am here to testify to that. In the 20th century, a religi Unitarian religious educator, Sophia Lyon Foz, wrote, there are three abiding values in prayer. The quiet meditation on life, the reaching out toward the universal and infinite, and the courageous facing of one's profoundest wishes. Unitarian Universalist minister Reverend Jack Mendelson wrote, the purpose of prayer is to transform those doing the praying, to lift them out of fear and selfishness into serenity, patience, determination, and belonging. If we, be if we begin to approach prayer in this manner, it assumes an entirely new significance. Today, Larry and Tad and I will explore four types of prayer in words and music. From Anne Lamott's work, we're taking prayer as thanks, help, and wow. <laughs> but also because of our own experiences, we threw listening into the mix as a prayerful form to consider. Larry will start us off with thanks. Long time no see. I think you're the same congregation. Okay. Good morning. If you are familiar with the musical Fiddler on the Roof, you may remember Tevya, the impoverished milkman with five daughters, and how he would converse with Yahweh. He would complain, ask for favors, comment on injustice, marital problems, traditions, parenting issues, and sometimes begrudgingly give thanks. He was more of an oive kind of guy. But when he did give thanks, he got into it like this. To life, to life, la hayam, la hayam, la hayam, to life. Life has a way of confusing us, blessing and bruising us. Drink la hayam, to life. Thanks is not always a pure and shining emotion but it can shine in otherwise difficult times. At least for me, it often goes unnoticed during the rush of our daily business. A lot of what passes for thanks are little more than social niceties, and that's fine, but it's not the gratefulness that I'm speaking to. I have to take time to find my gratitude where it, wherever it might be hiding after a day of listening to the news, shopping, doing chores around the house. That awareness can often come to me while listening to music or struggling with a poem. But if I sit myself down 
and empty myself in meditation, almost always the first emotion I notice is gratitude for having the time and the good sense to practice. Thanks usually is accompanied by words of praise. Whether one says praise God or thank God literally amounts to the same thing. But it does connote an unequal relationship which is something that I disavow as an adult because my prayer is addressed to the deepest spiritual part of me and not an external deity. My primary experience of prayer is a longing expressed in song. The words are secondary. Growing up prior to the Catholic adoption of the vernacular in services, the mass and many hymns were in Latin, which helped me to not care what the words meant. My favorite prayerful music is Barber's Adagio for Strings. It's guaranteed to bring me to tears. Tears of gratitude, a fusion of joy and pain, living in peril and blessed with kindnesses. One of, <clears throat> one, I'm sorry, one following unimpeded into the other and back again. I feel I am most alive in the thrall of that experience. Like the fiddler on the roof, decidedly not a safe place to practice or to perform. And yet, we are thankful for the music of our struggles to bring the best we have to offer to a world so deeply in need of kindness and thanks. I am like Tevya, constantly in dialogue, speaking and waiting to hear what song is in my heart. Oh, if I were a rich man. Da 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 Would it spoil some great eternal plan? If I were a peaceful man, a kinder man, a thankful man. Da 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 Thanks. Are we on? There we go. Next, we get to share in the hymn, For All That Is Our Life. If you are at home on Zoom, we invite you to sing along to your heart's content. If you are here with us in the building, we are not quite ready yet for congregational singing, but we get to remember that we are built to experience music not only in our voices, but in our hearts and our minds and our bodies. So we invite you to hum along, or sway along, or tap along, and enjoy.
Prayer has become an important part of my spiritual life. Prayer, as Reverend Jack Mendelssohn says, transforms me. For many years now, you've probably heard me say that I pray regularly for you as individuals and as a community. They're not the intercessory prayers of my Catholic childhood, you know, the ones with specific asks, like I used to pray, please, God, make my brother stop bugging me. Not those kind of prayers. More like the Buddhist metta prayers for ease, peace, and joy for you in whatever state you are in. In recent years, however, as we've all gone through collectively such trauma, and I'm talking even pre-pandemic trauma of the political system we've been living in. And as I've suffered my own losses, been overcome by my own despair and sense of powerlessness, new forms of prayer have emerged for me. I now pray for my own strength and courage, sometimes for my own capacity to surrender to let go, to lean back into something greater than me. While I believe that there is something beyond our own cognitive knowing, I don't have a sense of a personal singular God in direct relationship with me. I'm more of a panentheist. My direct experience of the holy is vast and interconnected beyond time and space. My prayers for help, my surrendering to my own limitations, are a calling in of the spiritual energies of ancestors, goddesses, animals, and trees. And they're a calling, a listening to my deepest self, which is not separate, as Larry also expressed. We are living in a time when we can, when what we can know with our minds, when the amount of information and the amount of suffering that is coming in is so much more than has ever been a part of the human experience. Taking all that in without support is damaging to our souls and even our bodies. I've come to realize that even the support of other humans living in this time is not enough for what I need. So over the past few years, with the help of a community of mystics, I have cultivated a spirit team and learned to ask them for support when I am having my darkest moments. My prayers are both humbling and courageous. And when I bow to the mystery and ask for help, I can feel so much less alone in my struggles. This poem, Love Abundant, by the Reverend Alicia Ford, speaks to this part of my own prayer life as well. Alicia, Alicia is the Unitarian Universalist Association's director of the International Office and she's also the former minister of our Loveland congregation, just up the road. Love Abundant. 
I lift my eyes up to the hills. From where will my help come? My help comes from love abundant. My help comes from the hills. My help, my help, it comes from ancient mothers whose hearts beat in mine. It comes from the trees that sway and the breeze that sways them. My help comes from all that was and is and will ever be. I lift my eyes, hushed by the soothing touch of waves caressing wounded shores, wounded souls. I lift my eyes to, her, to the horizon bathed by the hum of mothers and mothers' mothers, cradling, gently rocking. I lift my voice, call of the sea, tree, sister, moon, mother, earth, my soul weeping, a symphony of life overflowing. I give myself. I too hum through every pore, with every breath, I give myself an extension of all that is, was, and ever will be. Grace and I are going to play for you uh, a song born from, uh, well, it's a Negro spiritual, um, and it's called I've Been in the Storm So Long. Um, and obviously the circumstances under which many of these spirituals were, were written um, were one of great suffering um, when, it's, when the conditions of the world are so uncontrollable that you that one may have no other recourse but to appeal to a higher power to come to your aid. Um, I'm going to read you the words. I've been in the storm so long. I've been in the storm so long. I've been in the storm so long. Oh, give me a little time to pray. Give me a little time to pray. With a hung down head and an aching heart, give me a little time to pray. When I was looking into, into this song, I came across a little YouTube um, presentation by an African-American musicologist who reminded, or rather instructed us, that um, we should refer to these spirituals as Negro spirituals and not African-American spirituals, which feels a little uncomfortable, honestly, for me. But he says that that pays homage and due respect to the circumstances that, uh, you know, under which these were written, that these, these people were not considered Americans at the time. So it's a reminder of that suffering. So I've been in the storm so long.
God speaks in the silence of the heart. Listening is the beginning of prayer. Those words are from Mother Teresa. Years ago, I offered a class here at the fellowship entitled Living by Heart. The class was developed by Reverend Laurel Hallman, who's the former minister of the Dallas Unitarian Universalist Congregation. At that time, I had found it difficult to pray or even to meditate for that matter. My monkey mind was, and I would say still is, quite hard to tame. And I still get into that wonderful mind game of blaming myself each time I allow my thoughts to, you know, I start to cling on to my thoughts. I'm assuming I'm not the only one about this. Pema Chodron also told, said, I've heard her say that even now she has that. So, But what I learned from Reverend Laurel Hallman, however, was that shifting from meditation to prayer, the ask or the task was different. Unlike many forms of meditation, which invite us to, to let go of our thoughts and to, to cultivate a sense of emptiness, a releasing of sorts, Prayer is about listening to what arises, to what the psalmists in the Bible call the still, small voice, cradling it gently like a messenger of what's important. Both involve slowing down enough, quieting oneself, removing myself, oneself from the hustle and bustle of the day's demands. But for me, prayer as listening is a relational invitation rather than an exercise of more detachment. Both have their value, and now I practice both. Now, of course, the question arises, especially amongst Unitarian Universalists, about prayer. Who are we praying to? Who are you listening to? Two, Reverend Hallman offers her wisdom. This was about maybe about 10 years ago. She delivered a Barry Street lecture. Um, to, it's an esteemed lecture to Unitarian Universalist colleagues every year. And she, she says, I recall the good advice from 12-step programs. Just take care of your side of the street. That's what I do with prayer, she said. I take care of my side of the street with my gratitude, my amazement, my praise, my fear, my anger, and my hurt. And I take care of the side of the street my congregation is on. I figure the other side of the street, God or not God, can take care of itself. And we can save the theological discussions for later. The answer to, it answers the question of who by saying the question is not essentially re uh, relevant to this kind of relational approach to prayer. It has taken me a long time to wrap my head around that. Especially because when, when I pray, or I feel like the English language around prayer nouns God, or nouns the prayer is to someone, but in my own lived experience of the holy, it's a verb, it's an action, it's an experience. So I'm constantly working with myself to not get caught up in that so that it gets in the way of my own listening, of my own capacity to tap in to the intimate in my own being and the ultimate mystery outside of me. Now, prayer in listening comes in many forms, sometimes in the quiet of my rocking chair. My next step in a very difficult tangle arises from within and becomes so clear. Sometimes leaning up against a tree, the wisdom of nature responds wordlessly to my deepest yearnings. One time in my early 30s, walking through a redwood grove and listening deeply, these words arose from the moist, dark earth. Live freely, love boldly, tread softly. 
Those six words have guided my life ever since. Prayer, understood first and foremost as listening, connects me both to that intimate of my deepest self and the ultimate, my profound interconnection with all of creation. At my best, I can let go of my monkey mind that's trying to get the verb tenses right and doesn't want to use a noun and is trying to let go all those things. At my best, when I let go of that, I am deeply listening and deeply connected. Good morning again. We're going to slip into the wow section. Um, and to do this, I'm going to need your cooperation. We're going to meditate. Don't, no one leave, lock the doors. <laughs> this meditation will begin with a poem that I wrote about my meditation practice. It will hopefully help you to relax into an experience 
of transcendence, or in the parlance of this service, a wow moment. So get comfortable and soften into a steady posture. Breathe deeply and slowly. Try to undo your arms and let them hang. Uh, Find a place where gravity just takes them. Paying attention to your breath, breathing deeply. When these instructions are done, I will ring the bowl once to begin. I will read the poem slowly, and when I am finished launching you on your journey, you will be on your own for a few minutes. At that point, I will ring the bowl again to signal the end of the exercise. So now, if you are comfortable doing so, gently close your eyes or pick a spot on the floor in front of you, perhaps that is visually bland. Suspend all judgment of your thoughts and visions Hold no opinion. Let the mystery wash over you. Embrace whatever comes to mind as your reality, as fact, without shame, explanation, or proof. Allow yourself to dissolve to become infinite and minuscule at the same time. There are no contradictions. All that comes to mind simply is full stop. If your mind wanders, come back to the breath without scolding or feelings of failure. Rather, rejoice that you notice that you are on autopilot and have returned to mindfulness. You will succeed. As Yoda says, there is no try. Either do or do not. The gift of the effort is to know that you are intimately part of the universe, deeply connected and floating on the eternal present moment, which is available to you whenever you turn to it. without expectation. Give thanks for the silence by sliding deep into it, like dropping your head below the waterline to find silence is buoyant, weightless, like the white noise of care, the refrigerator falls quiet. The tank is empty, the space unoccupied, the mind is free. 
words have taken a holiday and left everything lukewarm. The light is soft, without shadows, without glare, still is a noun, is a verb, is an adjective, is everything. Here is the point around which the universe revolves. It admits neither life, nor death, nor struggle. It asks nothing and tells nothing, but settles on the moment like time's equivalent of snow suspended in forever. Silence is enough, and yet it is nothing. It is without drawing attention to itself. It is a sigh without exhalation, a flower without scent wordless womb, water of weightless waiting, without expectation or desire. It is a flameless fire. Silence is the balance between less and more. It is a wave vacant shore. It is a note-free song. It is the absence of right and wrong. It is forever gone, but always here. It is vague, yet the epitome of clear. It is white on white, in 3D. It is the wall on which I erase me, opening to my infinite family.
Namaste. Good morning. My name is Jim Highsmith. 
I am a longtime UU, over 60 years, and I've been a member of seven UU congregations. This testimonial will explore part of an old UU fundraising joke. Catholics can talk about money, but they can't talk about sex. New yous, on the other hand, can talk about sex, but we can't talk about money. So I'm going to talk about money. Wendy and I chaired a pledge drive at our Salt Lake City congregation in the mid-1990s. Don't get any ideas. I remember vividly going to the board meeting to get approval for our pledge drive goal. We asked for a 75% increase. You have never heard a group of UU elders speak like they did. <laughs> It'll never fly was the only repeatable remark. <laughs> when I scraped two board members off the ceiling, Wendy and I continued. 75% isn't our real goal. The real goal is to challenge people to reflect deeply on what this congregation means to them and our community. If you ask me for a 5% or a 10% increase, I might do it without thinking too deeply. But I can't even consider a 75% increase without serious, serious reflection. That is what we wanted, and the board approved the goal. As we left the meeting, one initially skeptical board member said, I'm already considering raising my pledge by 75%. In the final analysis, it's not the amount of the pledge that's important, but the depth of reflection you put into the decision. Upon my own reflection, I've come to the following. I embrace UU principles, but I admit they're often confusing. I have wonderful UU friends, although they are sometimes challenging. I find the fellowship a comfortable place to be, but I often find it uncomfortable also. Principles, friends, fellowship, comfortable, challenging, confusing, uncomfortable, just perfect. And by the way, that year in Salt Lake City, we raised pledges by glasses and the mic. I'm not sure I have ears. Each week, we remind ourselves of the abundance of our lives. And this community, by giving half of our plate away to other organizations that share our values. This week, the half plate is for the Out Boulder Fire Fund. Working independently and in collaboration, Out Boulder County connects advocates, educates, and provides programs to ensure LGBTQ plus people and communities thrive in Boulder County and beyond. The Fire Fund has already distributed over 18,000 to LGBTQ plus people and their families. Your contributions today will be matched by donations from an Out Boulder donor. Please give generously as the virtual plate passes as you so often do. As our musical reflection begins, we invite you to reflect upon this question. Do you have a spiritual practice which involves prayer and or meditation? And what is that like for you? And if you are on Zoom, feel free to write your answer into the chat.
for the work of this fellowship, bringing love, reason, and compassion and justice to this world. And to the Out Boulder Marshall Fire Fund, we dedicate our offerings this day. I recognize we're running a little later than usual, but I do want to have this time for our sharing of joys and concerns this morning. So if you're on Zoom, you can, uh, and you'd like to share a joy or concern, you can type it into the chat window, sending it to everyone. And I will then read those aloud, and Larry will place a stone in the waters on your behalf. If you're in the sanctuary this morning, you can come up front, share your joy or concern using the microphone, standing on this side of Larry and uh, add a stone to the water. Or you can always add a stone in silence if that's your preference. Beloveds, in these times, all we are left to do is to be human together. Let us bring all of our love, all of our challenges, all of our curiosities and our vulnerabilities to one another, knowing that in our humanness we are healing the world. May it be so. I have a couple of announcements today. Um, Tad Coryeth and his beautiful wife, Emily Coryeth, are doing a performance here, now that we're back open, on March 19th, that's Saturday evening. There were 14 seats left here. And on Friday, March 18th, you could go down to Denver. They will be doing it at the First Unitarian Society in Denver. So um, you can get tickets in the weekly email, um, or an, and it'll go out on our listserv as well, so if you'd like a ticket. And one last reminder, if you have not met with your steward, to please do that and have a beautiful conversation with your steward. You could consider raising your pledge by 75% if you like, um, and whatever pledge you are able to make. Um, the conversation and the connection is really what we're looking for, and your pledge becomes just a part of being a, a part of this congregation and its beauty. So. And now I will extinguish our chalice, but not the warmth of love, the light of truth, or the energy of action. These we carry in our hearts until we go meet again. Go forth, beloveds, in love and peace. Come back again as this community provides us strength and solstice. Blessed be. Amen.